Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Southeast Radio. My name is Walter O'Brien, and I'm a genius. Walter! Einstein had an IQ of 165. Mine's 197. Sign them, and I'll tell you how I hacked into NASA. Carl to command. We have Scorpion. He's just a kid. When I was a kid, it got me into a little trouble. Now that I'm an adult, nothing's changed. That's why I started this company. A tactical team made up of the smartest people on the planet. That was a promo clip for an upcoming TV series, Scorpion, which is due to launch in the US next week. It sounds dramatic, it seems surreal, but more interestingly, it's based on the life of Irishman Walter O'Brien, the founder and owner of Scorpion Computer Services. Walter, who now lives in America, joins me on the phone now to discuss his fascinating career. As we heard from the clip, Walter, you were famous for hacking into NASA at the age of 13, and as a result of this feat, you were able to move to stateside on an extraordinary ability visa. Did many opportunities follow on from this move? Many, many opportunities. So, yeah, I was a curious kid, and uh, I had done a little hacking. And uh, in Ireland at the time, you could only connect to the ARPANET, which was what the internet was, the early name for the internet over home telephone lines, so it wasn't that hard to track down where I was. And um, the uh, that allowed me to meet some of the US government officials and uh, build up a reputation for cybersecurity work and turn them into customers, which Department of Justice and the Air Force, the Navy, the Army, they're all customers of mine today. And um, I managed to get a special visa called an EB-11. It's the same visa Albert Einstein and Winston Churchill got as a national asset to the U.S. And that, the background checks for that visa by Homeland Security are similar to the background checks you need for top secret clearance. So that allowed me to do military work over here and uh, start working on very, very difficult problems, but they didn't really have any budget limitation. Um, so, for example, on the the new fighter jet they spent over 50 billion dollars developing this one plane and uh, sometimes you need that kind of money to do the kind of breakthrough research at the same time you started a company scorpion computer services i'm wondering what was the original concept for the business itself well scorpion was my hacker name uh so scorpion computer services was me doing any kind of service people were willing to pay me for for computers And at the time, in Ireland, it was pretty basic. It was fixing point-of-sale systems, barcoding systems, inventory systems, even systems for for pubs and bars. Those were all the local businesses. uh, They used to do that before, during, and after school for for extra funding. Uh, One of the interesting things is I never planned too far ahead for my business. From year to year, I never knew what I would have next in terms of what types of customers I would have. Uh, but I just kept improving my knowledge of how to solve problems uh, and my, my arsenal of software and techniques that I could apply to any kind of issue or any kind of problem. I'm interested in finding out how you set about improving your overall arsenal of techniques. What was involved in that? A lot of it was I read a lot of books. I was self-taught as well. Um, I went on to university later and studied computer science and artificial intelligence, which gave me the language and basics to be able to describe and properly construct code. Um, Constantly kind of observing and listening to what the customers want. For example, we developed a 240 point inspection, which is a due diligence, kind of like a mechanic checking out a used car that the customers would use before they invest in a startup, making sure that all the uh, I's are dotted and T's are crossed from a technical perspective. And that became a very popular package for customers to buy and a good way for them to get to know if we were, if we were good at what we, we do. With an IQ of 197, you epitomized the word genius. But how did you use that talent to develop and sustain a successful business? Well, I have a memory for anything I understand. So uh, all the problems that I solve, the code that I see, the things that I write, the things that I hack, I still remember them perfectly even from 20 years ago. Um, 
that becomes very useful when you look at a new problem and you realize that you can apply Lego pieces of, uh, of how to solve problems from previous years. Um, also recognizing that um, I work well with other intelligent people. So finding them, going out and recruiting and finding other high IQ individuals, but then raising their EQ and teaching them how to work together. It was a differentiator from other companies. You know, no other company has a minimum IQ to join the company. Excellent. And tell me, what's involved in sourcing people with a high level of IQ? Have you a particular process behind that? Well, our minimum IQ is 150, which is about 1 in 10,000 people. So it's hard enough to recruit good people normally, but trying to recruit them with that requirement becomes more difficult. So we um, have various methods. We look at 10,000 school reports and look for A's and F's because the people that are turned on and off to intelligence depending on whether they like the subject or the teacher. Mm. When we find one, we then do use genealogists to map the family tree because IQ is hereditary, and we find cousins and brothers and uncles who are also smart. Uh, we bring them on board. Then we also have fake banks across Europe that when they get hacked into, they have one file on the network, which is a job offer with our security team. And then uh, anyone who qualifies for Mega Menza, which is 180 IQ or higher, or compete in the Olympics like I did in the informatics, we reach out to those people. Once you get these very high IQ individuals on board, how do you manage them? Carefully, uh, like porcupines make love. <laughs> um, the, one of the key things we realized is while we can raise their EQ to perhaps an average level, we're never going to get them to be super uh, sensitive, good salespeople, schmoozers, marketing people, etc. So what we did is we went the opposite direction and we hired people with high EQ who have a reasonable IQ. And those people uh, help baby, we call them the super nannies because they babysit the geniuses and the customers. And in our business, the customer's always wrong. Uh, <laughs> by the time a customer comes to us, we have to rephrase the question they're really asking and then uh, work with the, the geniuses to solve the problem. And that two layer cake of having high EQ people work with high IQ people seems to be the secret to this being sustainable. One of the products that you developed over the years was the scenario generator. Tell us a little bit about how that can be applied to a business situation. Sure. Uh, that took us about four years of my time personally to code it uh, up to 20 hour days. And it breaks the laws of computability. It does many things that were not supposed to be possible. Uh, SendGen. Uh, stands for Scenario Generator, and it um, it's like two computers playing chess against each other. They will play every possible move in the game. And we abstracted the rules of chess from that, where we can make anything into a game of chess, including business, legal contracts, supply chains, logistics, anything where you need to optimize many combinatorials or many variables. The most common use in business is Human error is rated at 3%. Um, and if you cannot afford 3% downtime because you're a banking system or a telecom system or air traffic control or something like that, and you want to go beyond human error and close that 3% gap, we use artificial intelligence to do that. So it can guarantee that every new version of your system that you deploy any given Friday is exhaustively tested, 100% regression, and proven mathematically to be no worse than the previous release. And that way, at least you don't bring your business down to its knees on a Monday morning because the software upgrade didn't work. One of your most recent ventures has been ConciergeUp.com. What's that all about? ConciergeUp was an interesting uh, realization. Um, it's, and it's a perfect example of where no matter how old your business is, it's been after 25 years, every year you should sit back and rethink it and say, see where things are going. So for 25 years, we've said, we will solve any technical problem. But then I realized that we had 14 billionaire customers, two royal families, and those customers started asking us to solve problems for them that had nothing to do with technology. Kidnap their daughter back from Libya, uh, put a shark tank in their office, um, help them make their book a bestseller. And they just believed in us as organized intelligence, that if we put our heads together and thought about something and used our contacts, 
that we could figure out a way to do anything, effectively moving from hacking systems to hacking life. We um, coined the phrase concierge up because normally you concierge down mm. things that are too simple to do yourself. So at concierge you can give us any wish, any funded wish of something that's too complicated to do yourself and uh, we'll do it for you. Tell me about some of the more interesting business-related projects that you've worked on under ConcierGeUp.com. Form a casino in a foreign country and deal with everything from the politicians to the gaming licenses to how often the pool boy comes to clean the pool. Um, Another one is simply people's personal finances. Where is all my money? How much am I worth? Uh, How do I reorganize it all to be optimal in terms of outperforming the market every year? Um, which area is going to be hot in real estate five years from now? And how can I put money into it early using big data to analyze where the, the economy and people and demographics are shifting? Um, uh, there's so many. Move all my data into the cloud. So it's in a what we call a moon vault. It's all my data is in a vault as, as if it was on the moon. So no one government can subpoena the data or ever see it because it's not in any one country's jurisdiction. Many businesses have struggled against the force of the recession. Walter, what advice would you impart that could assist these companies here locally to get their businesses back on track? Rethink everything. Uh, Don't accept any assumptions or the way things are always done or what everyone else does. Be unique. You know, walk to the beat of your own drum. Move in your own direction. I think in Ireland... There's a huge amount of complacency when it comes to technology. Um, People still brag about, oh, I can't even turn on my computer or I don't even have email. That's like bragging about being illiterate enough to not be able to read or write in today's uh, today's world. So it should be something to be ashamed of, not something to think is cool. And uh, I see a lot of that, um, even as I interact with Ireland today. I say to people, you know, set up an appointment, shoot me an Outlook invite, Skype me, scan my press and email it over. And people are not capable of doing those basic things that I'm able to do with third world countries elsewhere. Mm. And it, uh, it shocks me that that's still acceptable. What advice would you give to owners on how to improve their critical thinking skills? I think on the critical thinking skills side, it's, um, I, I think it's a little bit business specific But I think uh, one of the things you can't do enough of is advisory boards. Going out and uh, working hard to form an advisory board of people who don't need the salary of the advisory board, meaning people who aren't scared to be fired. So they won't be scared to tell you the bad news. And that helps your critical thinking when you have a sounding board of people who aren't scared to tell the CEO he's wrong. And in relation to the advisory board, talk me through the type of people that should be on this. Well, I usually look for brains that are wired differently. When people spend their life being a lawyer or being a doctor or being an investor, it affects their brain. Their brain wires itself to think in a different way. So having as much different wiring as possible. So in my advisory board, I've got a number one athlete, number one doctor, uh, a lawyer, uh, accountant. I've got... uh, um, computer folks, obviously, and scientists, and uh, uh, just a complete, uh, even a yoga teacher, uh, spiritual leaders, very, very different brains. And when I throw out a problem, by the time I have a problem I can't solve, it's usually a pretty tough problem. So now I get to throw out a problem and get 14 other people's opinions on it with brains that are wired entirely differently than mine. As Einstein said, you cannot solve a problem with the same thinking that created it. And uh, so the last thing I need to do is talk to a whole bunch of other computer guys because they're going to think of everything I just already thought of. Notoriety continues to follow your careers, as you've said, to be personally responsible for catching the Boston bombers. Explain your involvement in identifying the perpetrators of this horrific crime. Well, our company develops technology for government and uh, and military use that does what they call image recognition and motion flow analysis for video. So we had developed technology, one piece of it that was critical, that detects when nothing happens in a video. So when they had 4,000 hours of footage for the Boston bombing, this is the technology that allows you to figure out that only 20 hours of that footage had actually anything interesting going on. And then 
using uh, motion flow analysis and the ability to use facial recognition and tracking people's heads, we were able to tell herd behavior. Um, but most people stood there. Most people went down when it happened and act surprised. Most people got up, scrambled, and ran in the same direction at the same speed. Um, so someone who moved early, someone who didn't act surprised, someone who walked in the opposite direction at a slower pace, that kind of behavior sticks out like a sore thumb and becomes suspicious behavior or what we call an OOI, an object of interest. That, that's been used to solve several problems and avoid people dying in several countries. Now, that approach seems to be common sense approach to solving the problem, but is your unique selling point in relation to the development of the software that supports that common sense approach? Correct, yeah. I mean, it's a, a human can cannot do this as efficiently as a machine can. So it's the fact that software can now do this approach rather than people looking at every piece of footage to say, yep, I did not need to look at that piece of footage. At the age of 39, Walter, you've achieved phenomenal success and worldwide acclaim. But what does the future hold for Walter O'Brien and Scorpion Computer Services? Are there any other ambitions that you have yet to achieve? Well, we're, uh, we've saved 400,000 lives, caught four terrorists and stopped two wars so far. <laughs> um, and you're only, getting, t- you're only getting warmed up? Uh, well, after the TV show launches, our estimates are we should triple that goodness in about five years. We should have uh, triple those numbers, so another 1.2 million lives, uh, because we'll have more geniuses join us, and we'll have more people be aware that can call us problems. So um, that, that's one thing the future will hold for us. Uh, we have planned way into the future, so we work on a project for the year 2045, a 31-year project, and you can check it out at 2045.com. But that project is for working on our immortality, uh, uploading our consciousness as software, our consciousness and our memory, so we can port it into stem cell bodies. That way, uh, when our body fails, our consciousness doesn't. And that's all that matters. You know, our bodies are really just uh, meat vehicles or rental cars, if you like, for our consciousness. There's no reason our consciousness and our memories have have to die when our body does. From a business perspective, Walter, and looking down the track in terms of business opportunities, where do you think the big opportunities are in business from a technology perspective over the next five to ten years? Data visualization techniques, um, Oculus Rift, and various technologies like that will completely change how we view, understand, learn, and experience and entertain ourselves. And for anyone who's not familiar with Oculus Rift, start Googling it, learning it quickly. Um... Personal, extreme personalization, both in the technology that we'll wear that will be integrated into our skin and part of us, along with the um, uh, extreme personalization of knowing every person. So for marketing and sales, everything becomes extremely personal and targeted. Uh, we will not have privacy anymore, not that we do now, but uh, we'll have even less privacy. But uh, the, consider- the manufacturers will get a lot more uh, specific and customized in providing each person what they want based on that lack of privacy. And this is not talking about way in the future. This is talking about three to eight years ago. This already started and it's happening now and it's just going to continue developing. I mean, just look at what Google, what companies Google bought over the last three or four years as a guideline. In terms of education, we all understand education to be bricks and mortar from a primary school perspective into a post-primary school into university. What changes do you see becoming mainstream in that area over the next five to ten years? I think anything beyond elementary school will be uh, redundant or people won't bother anymore going to high school or university. Uh, it's already happening uh, on the states where a lot of people used to be homeschooling. Now it's just people signing up for their education being load balanced across YouTube where if a kid likes Kids are not all the same, so if they like to learn by doing or learn by seeing or learn by hearing, um, they can be matched up with the teacher who likes to teach the way they like to learn. And uh, these teaching platforms are getting better and stronger and accelerating the moment of cognition, which is the moment when the light bulb turns on. And um, that will continue uh, uh, improving far better than, than the inefficiency, about 90% inefficiency in going to high school and trying to teach with one teacher and one method 30 different kids the same thing 
and have them repeat it over and over again when they could easily reference it or look it up anyway uh, on Google. So education needs to change completely into life lessons, philosophy, psychology, and, and the things that, the, the basic thinking about thinking that people need to be aware of, because everything else they can look up. And there's no point in memorizing geography or history when you can look it up in less than a second. From a social media perspective, we've seen phenomenal change in that area over the last five years. Where is that going? Well, that will stay very similar, other than with the Oculus Rift, people will be able to interact with each other more naturally. But that is the area where all of the uh, privacy goes away and the information is learned about each person. Uh, you can tell 90% about someone simply by seeing what likes they have on Facebook. You can tell their religious beliefs, their sexual preferences, their, whether male or female, their age. You can guess all this stuff about 90% accurately based purely on all the things they like or, or don't like on Facebook. I'm interested in hearing your opinion on media. We've seen huge change in relation to newspapers. Newspaper sales are in decline worldwide. How do you think the world is going to change from how we consume media over the next five to ten years? I think we'll experience it rather than consume it. I think it will... um it's something we'll want to live through and be passed on to us. So, for example, we won't be reading books. Books will become electronic plug-ins to an experience that we have in our off hours. And uh, if we want to experience an old 1950s movie, we would live through the murder mystery ourselves as a character in the movie rather than just reading it passively. Where do you think the innovation is going to come from within our health system over the coming years? Well, I think uh, projects like the Tricorder Project, I mean, that, that, that terminology comes from Star Trek where the guy would run around with a little handheld device that could scan a guy's body on a scene and tell you all the vitals and blood pressure and broken bones or what's going on. And that, for anyone who's not familiar with it, should Google it because it's hugely advanced now. Getting your retina through the eyeball can tell you a whole host of things about the health or lack of health of problems in your body. Um, so I think medicine, again, will get capitalized, commercialized, miniaturized, and um, uh, be much more practical and available to everyone. I think the, the archaic model of drag yourself down to the hospital and have one big machine that the whole city has to stand in line and wait to use is, uh, is going to go away. Where do you think the future is for Ireland? Um, revolution would be my guess. I mean, I, I, until a uh, severe shakeup happens in terms of the thinking, the education, and taking advantage of, there's a huge advantage to being a small country uh, because if you wanted to, you could change quickly. But Ireland behaves like a large country. <laughs> so if it wants to behave like a small country, it would uh, do things like legalize gambling, privatize the airports outsource uh, a lot of its tourism to, to optimize the marketing of it. Um, there's a whole number of things Ireland could do to take advantage of its structure that would fix Ireland. But um, the government would never allow it. Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Southeast.